welcome everyone. Um, my name is Julia Mahoney. I'm the Educational Program Administrator for Renew Theaters. This program is sponsored by the VESTA Fund, which allows us to make this free for our members. So we want to welcome our members and guests from each of the theaters, the Ambler, the County, the Princeton Garden, the Highway, and the Majestic, who is collaborating with us on this. Uh, the VESTA Fund is so thrilled by the way that our virtual events have been going that they've provided us with an additional grant to expand the series and bring in other theaters and more speakers. So we are officially launching our Deep Focus educational program. We are continuing with our classic film series, but are adding other tracks, such as the Asian American film series, which we are kicking off tonight. We also have an upcoming Middle Eastern film series and a set of discussions on Wes Anderson's films in anticipation of the French Dispatch. So stay tuned for those. Um, tonight we're discussing Flower Drum Song, but a couple of upcoming events we have are we have uh, The Greatest Show on Earth, the circus film, which will be discussed next Tuesday, September 28th, as part of the classic film series. And then we're going to launch our Wes Anderson series with a talk on the Royal Tannenbaums next Wednesday, September 29th. But you can also find any of the past recordings on the Deep Focus website, which is deepfocus.film. I just want to go over a couple of Zoom protocols before we get going. So I do request that everybody remain on mute unless they are speaking. Uh, we will start with a talk led by Anne and then open it up to discussion. We ask that if you have a question or comment that you please use the raise hand feature, which is found in the menu at the bottom of your screen. And I will call on speakers. Um, we will likely open up the conversation to allow people to jump in later uh, as it gets rolling. The chat feature will also be in effect. So please use that to discuss anything um, that you want that is related to the film. And it often ends up being a lively sidebar. And we can also bring things in from the chat into our discussion here. But now it is time to introduce our guests. So our speaker for tonight also happens to be the guest curator of the series, Anne Ann Lin Chen, a professor of English at Princeton University and affiliated faculty in the program in American Studies, the program in Gender and Sexuality Studies, um, and the Committee on Film Studies. She is an interdisciplinary and comparative race scholar who focuses on the uneasy intersection between politics and aesthetics, drawing from literary theory, race and gender studies, film and architectural theory, legal studies, psychoanalysis, and critical food studies. She works primarily with 20th century American literature and visual culture with a special focus on Asian American and African American literatures. In addition to scholarly publications, too, too numerous to mention here, she's a contributor to the New York Times, The Atlantic, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and the Huffington Post. So please join me in welcoming Anne for tonight. There you go. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining me. And if you're comfortable, please turn your camera on just because I think these days, the more we can see each other's faces, the better. <laughs> um, but you, know, you don't have to be, it'd be great if you could turn your camera on. So I'm just going to talk for about 10 minutes and I'm going to try to keep an eye on the clock here because I'm much more interested in having a conversation with everyone here than, than lecturing at you. Um, but this is kind of an amazing film. It is at once, I think, embarrassing and engrossing, uh, intriguing and problematic, you know, it's all those things. Um, so I thought I would begin by um, just saying a about three things that I think are particularly remarkable about this film. And then um, maybe pose some questions or some questions that the film raises that we could talk about if you're interested, or of course you can bring up your own questions. Um, but the first thing that's really remarkable about this film is that this is the first Hollywood production with an all Asian cast. And it's quite amazing uh, because prior to, if you think about this, prior to this, um, whatever representations we get on the big screen about the figure of the Asian or the Asian American, it's always really rather terrible, right? It's, it's yellow face, you know, Dr. Fu Manchu in a yellow face for over 50 years. Um, it is um, images of Asian women as geisha or slave girls, or, you know, all kinds of stereotypes. So, um, to actually see Asian performers on the big screen, this is the first time. And so it's quite remarkable for that reason. And it's still remarkable today because it will be another 32 years before we see another movie <laughs> with an all Asian cast and that's Joy Luck Club. 
And then after Joy Luck Club, you get another 27 years before we see something like Crazy Rich Asian. Right, so they are actually so like if you're looking at the history of, um, of you know Western, especially Hollywood mainstream cinema, you, looking for the you know so-called real Asian and Asian American bodies is it's actually quite rare, right? So I think it's Flower Drums on remains a particular flashpoint in um, cinematic history for for this one reason, and we'll talk more about it. But I think it's also quite amazing to think about what it means to see all these Asian you know, Asian looking bodies um, doing Western dance, you know, Western music, and then what does that mean? Um, a second thing that's remarkable about this is the, is the story of the discovery of Flower Song Song as a story. So it was a novel written by a Asian American author called C.Y. Lee. He wrote the novel in 1957. And it's kind of amazing that this novel came out and about, you know, just, about um, San Francisco Chinatown. And Edward G. Robinson read it and he fell in love with the book. And he wanted to have make it into turn it into a show, a Broadway show. He wanted to play the father in yellow face, <laughs> of course. Um, and then Joseph Field, who was a very famous Broadway producer, came along and he was super interested in it. And next thing you know, Robert Rogers and Hammerstein is knocking on the door, offering to write the music for it. And the Broadway, which came out, Broadway version, which came out in 1959, which is only two years after the book was published, was directed by Gene Kelly. So one of the questions that we have about um, this movie is that, or this story, is that what is it about this little novel, which is about a little known insular community that actually capture the imagination of all these men from Hollywood, and what is it about the story that captured the imagination of a nation? And in fact, if you read the, C, um, the C.Y. Lee novel, the original novel, it's, um, it's actually quite melancholic, bordering on the tragic, right? Because it was about Chinatown. And if you think about it, in 1957, Chinatown is just barely emerging out of 60 years of exclusion. Right. So the, the, just a quick history, the, um, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1924, um, which restricted and prohibited, um, it's the first and only race-based immigration act in US history. It restricted the immigration of Asians, definitely um, no women, no children, no unskilled or unskilled labor. But what happened was that there have been, of course, already a lot of Asians in America since the mid 1800s, for the gold rush in order to build the transcontinental continental, trans -continental railway and et cetera. And so these men, the, the exclusion act was met, designed to prevent these men from actually having a future in America. So what happened in those 60 years of restriction, you know, people call Chinatowns in America, bachelor societies. And it's because it's basically full of men growing old and dying, right? Um, and so this, this um, and this kind of the melancholy of, of a community in which marriage, love, and futurity are hardly something that's possible. It was the backbone of Lee's novel. And so that's why the novel was very melancholy and you know, a little bit, you know, a little tragic. Um, but somehow it trans somehow that captured the imagination of all these Hollywood types. And the next thing you know, it translated into this incredibly euphoric musical called Flower Drum Song, which is all about marriage, love, children, future, right? Um, and so that, trans that translation is remarkable and I think um, very, very uh, telling. And I also just wanna mention that that Exclusion Act was not completely lifted until 1952, right? at which point, and you really wasn't, but, but it was lifted, but then there was still all these quota. So it wasn't really until something called the Hard Collar Act of 1968 that the quotas were finally repealed and that Asians were allowed to become Asian American, to be naturalized. And so the character in the movie, Madame Liang, who becomes a citizen after taking five years of citizenship class, um, Madame Liang was actually, thus re re represents actually probably the first generation of what we would actually today call Asian Americans. Right. Prior to that, they were just Asians, right, in America, um, and so um, it is a um, kind of a, a significant moment. So, having said all that, 
there are some questions I would immediately sort of think about, right? Which is one, what does it mean to celebrate American nationhood, which is what this movie is really about, right? It's a celebration of citizenship. What does it mean to celebrate American nationhood vis-a-vis -a, -vis a community that has been legally and historically uh, excluded from US citizenship for decades? Right? Uh, two, how does Hollywood in 1962 make um, palatable, much less desirable, all these Asian looking body on stage when prior to that, there were not bodies that people want to look at at all. Right? So um, there's all these questions about, you know, how, how, you know, a big risk, right? They took a big risk making a movie about Asian Americans, about Asians becoming American when Asians becoming American has been precisely the thing of uh, anxiety and prohibition, you know, for, for so many, so many, many, many decades. Um, and so, um, it's really interesting to think about what this movie is meant to do. And I hope you can sort of already tell from what one of the things that's interesting about the movie is that it, it proclaims one thing, but it actually might do, some, might do something else, right? Um, that is to say, I think um, it is in many ways, a out on, the, on the surface, at the level of plot is very much about, there's basically two plots, the citizenship plot, Mrs. Le, Mrs. Uh, Madame Liang becoming, a citizen, and the other lot is the the plot is the, the marriage plot, right? The love plot. So the sort of the the the, the affairs of the hearts of the young people um, in the movie. Um, but I, I would suggest that these two plots are actually really related, because um, if we think about if we think about uh, Flower Drum Song and the plot of Flower Drum as really kind of a beauty contest, right? Between Mei Li the traditional Chinese good girl, and Linda Lo, the modern Americanized but immoral, you know, um, too sexy <laughs> girl. Um, they're, they don't, they not only represent two different kinds of femininity, right, traditional versus modern, et cetera, but they actually also represent two kinds of relationship to American citizenship. Many represent that which is illegal, foreign, right? She's a, you know, she called herself a wetback <laughs> right? um, at the, in the movie. Um, and Linda Lowe represents the really, she's very Americanized, right? She's the long-legged dame. She is, um, um, you know, she is independent. She is a working girl. Um, so, so there are all these ways in which I think the, the, the question of, you know, the beauty contest between Mei Li and Linda Lowe, which can be read along gender lines, of course, is also a parable about citizen, citizenship. And I think it's very interesting to think about the ways in which even though this is an all Asian cast and supposedly all Chinese characters in the plot, we nonetheless have all this anxiety in it about, I think, miscegenation. And the reason I say that is because I think Linda Lowe is coded very much as a, as a phantasmatic white female presence in the movie, even though she is supposed to be Chinese, right? Um, and it's not even that subtle, right? She's the, as I said, she's a long-legged dame. She's always, uh, especially in her big number, which is the, I enjoy being a girl, the mirror scene. Everything is white in that room. Now, you know, her towel, her background, everything. Um, and her, even her words, right? her materialism is very American. Her desire for independence is very American. Even her song is very American, right? She wants to be, you know, the wife of a home, a home, what is it, home of the brave and free male, right? Um, and so even her, um, her, even her words, right, play out this sort of fantasy. Um, and so one of the things that I think is revealing about a movie is that even though the plot says this is celebrating this new citizen in America, Asian Americans, even though the plot is celebrating that, it is also desperately trying to keep Chinatown segregated. Right? Um, and so, and, and that's why Linda Lowe doesn't win out. I mean, in many ways she should win because not only because it's Nancy Kwan and she's really the star, right, in, in, this, in this movie, um, but she doesn't win because she's too white, she's too Americanized. Um, so it's unimaginable for the movie to have the son of the Chinese patriarch pick a girl who's too American and too white, right? He must stay with his own kind, <laughs> right? And all the quotes. Um, and, and so suddenly we have this very funny situation where white mainstream 
um, culture is upholding traditional Chinese pa pa patriarchy because in doing so, it can re-secure the borders of Chinatown and you know, keep Chinatown, um, keep people to their own, right? Um, and so there's a way in which I think this movie is um, very much about re-segregating Chinatown, drawing the borders around it again, um, precisely at a moment when the border is supposed to be breaking down. Um, but at the same time, I think the movie also resists that, you know, whether or not it is the intention of the filmmakers, but he also resists that, by which I mean, even though we're supposed to be looking at nothing but Chinatown, the movie actually has never, the, the movie actually never leaves the West. And it reminds you of that all the time, right? At the beginning of the movie, we have, we're reminded that we're at, we're in San Francisco. And the fact that Meili and her father stole and crossed the border only reminds you of the border, right? And then even all throughout the movie, the, I feel like the, the, the characters are constantly reminding you that they are American. So for example, the song about Chinatown, Grand Avenue, and that song is titled, and the lyric is Grand Avenue, Ch Chinatown Grand Avenue, USA, right? So it's actually very geographically pins down Chinatown in the United States to remind you that Chinatown is not Chinese at all. It is actually legally speaking um, and imaginatively speaking an American invention. Or another example is Madame Liang when she, um, the, uh, you know, that, that really rather horrible <laughs> song, uh, Chap Sui. You know, when, and what's interesting about that is that even, even as it's, you know, we could say, oh, like, what a stereotype, you know, it's such a cliche, it's a stereotype. Um, it's a very terrible song because it's stereotypical. But it was, if you remember, it was actually announced as a stereotype. That is to say, every, you know, Madame uh, Liang, Mrs. Liang says, before she starts singing, Let's celebrate chop suey, that American invention, she says. And then to see this Asian American woman, one of the first Asian Americans, singing this song about the melting pot, about American melting pot and chop sueyness. But if you listen to the lyric, which includes all kinds of things from Dr. Zal to Jar Jar Gabor to nuclear war and all this stuff. But if you actually listen to the song, not a single thing in that song is Asian or Chinese, nothing. So to see this woman announce her song as an American invention, and then to see her sing a celebration about a citizenship that in fact, literally, lyrically wise, does not include her, cannot include her at all. It's incredibly poignant. Um, and so that's kind of what I mean about this movie. I feel like it is super on PC in all these places and it makes people uncomfortable, but in all the ways it is make people uncomfortable, I think it says something about the history, the uncomfortable history, of Asians in America. Um, so well, maybe I'll just stop there because we have 10 minutes um, and I can say more, but I, I'd much rather hear your thoughts and would love to have a conversation. All right, yeah, I think we, we already uh, have a hand, Ida. Okay. Well, I was going to say, I think actually Linda Lowe and Sammy got what they wanted too. Yes. It's story it's well you can melt into the melting pot if you like but you can also stay traditional if you'd like so it's maybe a little of both yeah I well how, how I, I think you're right um but, but what I, I have a slightly more cynical <laughs> look on take on that which is to say you know the movie basically ended up matching people of similar status right so the traditional go with the traditional the um the the kind of um uh, slightly, um, um, slightly miscegenated type, the kind that's the, those who are like too Americanized stay with the Americanized. So Linda Lowe stays with Sammy Wong because they're of the same sort of, that their level of citizenship is sort of very similar, right? I mean, I think it's very revealing that Linda Lowe doesn't end up with a white guy, you know? Um, and in fact, uh, if you think about it, in thinking about the, re, re, um, the redrawing of the border, um, if you think about it, there was only one white character in that. Do, do, you, do you guys remember who the white character was? He was a thief who broke into Chinatown, right? So that the white presence, even the white, you know, even the, so the, the one white presence in Chinatown is an illegal presence and it's someone he has to sort of break into it, you know? Um, and that actually reminds me in thinking about you know, the, um, what I had just said about the choices, 
you know, the other question I had is, um, I actually think there's another option in the movie. There's another contender in the beauty contest. But she is a contender that is so ignored that no one even think about her, even in the world of the movie. And that's Helen, right? If you think about it, Helen is a pretty decent choice, right? I mean, because if, if the movie is celebrating, really celebrating integration, she's the perfect one, right? She's not too Americanized. She's not too traditional. She's a little bit of both. Um, she is um, she has her family, but she also has her own job. Right? She's a seamstress. Um, her name is Helen, which connotes beauty itself. Um, and she also has, you know, she also had a big number at the end. Um, and in the world of movies, you know, if you have a big number, you're, you're kind of a star in the movie. And yet, if you go back and look at the movie, you see that they forgot her in the in the credit at the beginning of the movie. It's like she was totally forgotten <laughs> by the by the movie, and she was forgotten by you know by Wang Ta too, right? Um, and so I think like the fact that she is in some ways like if we're thinking about you know assimilation and the celebration of that, you know, she might have been a really good choice. Except the movie doesn't think she's a choice at all, and she's completely you know left out. Uh, Henry and then Elise. Hi, Anne. How are you? Yeah, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how relevant this is to the conversation, but you said this is an all Asian cast and it's really not. Um, Juanita Hall, yeah. African-American woman. Well, she, yes, yeah, she, she has played everything from Polynesian. Uh, oh yeah, I know, I know, she, I, I know she's played Asian characters, but she herself is not Asian or Asian American. No, and actually, you know, when I say it's an all Asian cast, it's also true that it is um, that the Asian, the so-called Asian, you know, it's, it's actually really heterogeneous, right? I mean, it's supposed to be about Chinese, but many of the actors yeah. are not Chinese. Linda Lo, I mean, um, Nancy right. is herself half British and half Chinese. Um, uh, Miyoshi Umeki, who plays Mei Li, is Japanese. And James Shigeta is, of course, Japanese-American as well. So... Um, so yeah, I think that um, um, someone else was talking about, um, uh, uh, just the other day I was watching a documentary about Sid Charisse, the dancer. And I, I, I had always assumed she has some kind of Latino, Latina background because she plays, you know, Latinas or Spanish or whatever, but you know, She's from Texas and she has no, <laughs> but, but the documentary said just because, just by virtue of having dark hair and dark eyes at that time, she was seen as ethnic, you know? So I think, yes, you're right. You're totally right to correct me. Juanita Hall wasn't Asian, but she was definitely racialized, right? Yeah, so oh, yes. Race subject. Yes, yeah. she was. Thank you. Elise? Okay, I hope I've unmuted myself, have I? <laughs> okay, I, I have a couple of comments and um, I, I appreciate your remarks, sort of, you know, a textual analysis of this movie. Um, but as a movie, let's, let's talk, can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I thought that the, except for Jack Sue, who I've always loved, I thought the acting was awful. I thought the Rodgers and Hammerstein songs were really below par. Um, and I was squirming the whole way through about the reduction of this culture that outdates ours by millennia uh, was, was just reduced to basically a crowd pleasing Broadway cartoon. Um, and I mean, I have no Asian in me, but I have some immigrant in me. And, you know, I was just upset on a number of levels. Could you address that a little bit, please? Yeah, I mean, this is what I mean about the film being embarrassing and, and, um, and cringy, as one of my students said, <laughs> you know. Um, and I have to say the story behind this, my relationship to this movie is, I heard about it, I never wanted to watch it. Because I just thought it was going to be too painful. And I've, and I've seen clips of it. You know, like I've seen clips of Pan, Pan Fanny and Chap Suey, and I just thought, oh my God, I, I, I cannot bear this, right? But a friend of mine was very smart, smart, said to me, 
you know, you should watch it because in all the ways in which it is cringy and bad, it says a lot about the problem of Asian American representation. And so, and I think he's right. I think that they, they are all, I do think that, um, I'm not gonna talk about whether I think the music is good because um, I'm actually not a musician and I think that's probably a lot of taste, but I do think that this was made in 1961, right? And just like something like Showboat was, I mean, if you go back and look at Showboat now, it's really horrifying, right? The way it thinks about race, the way it thinks about blackness, uh, the way the, the tragic mulatto must die. I mean, it's really painful, right? But in its time, it was still quite amazing that he even took up the theme of miscegenation. Um, it's the same thing with imitation of life. You know, there's all these, so anyway, so I, I think if you think about a movie in its moment, I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying that in its moment, it has some, some revolutionary value, even though it constantly undercut those values, as I said. I mean, you know, he wants to celebrate this community, but he does, but he want to make sure that's the community state <laughs> where it's supposed to be. Um, so it's, you know, it's a very, it's very ambivalent about the thing it's celebrating. Um, and, um, and yeah, and there's, you know, um, there's a lot of very, very uh, problematic thing. And I'll tell you, but, but let me tell you another, another side of the story, which is interesting, which is so years ago, um, David Henry Wang, who is a playwright, he wrote in Butterfly and some other very well-known plays. He wanted to do a revival of Flower Drum Song. And he called me up to see if I would rewrite it with him. And his, he told me what he wanted to do was to basically correct it. So it's not stereotyped, so it's not so painful. He wanted, for example, to make Linda Lowe a basically like a Marxist proletarian heroine, right? Instead of a money grabbing materialist. <laughs> um, and, you know, I actually didn't, I didn't do that project. Um, it's not because I don't mean it could be good. I mean, he ended up doing it. And, you know, but the reason why I didn't want to do that was because I actually thought that would, that would erase. So to me, this movie is an archive of a particular moment in American history and its anxieties about miscegenation, its anxiety about assimilation. And I think it's not a coincidence that, you know, why are all these Jewish men interested in flower drum song, right? It's because it is a parable about assimilation, but it is of course very ambivalent about it, right? You want to celebrate it, but he's also afraid of it. Um, you, you know, and in a way that's very revealing because I think America itself has always been that way. We have always celebrated integration, but not, right? Um, and just think about our relationship to assimilation. Oftentimes that word assimilation has a negative connotation, right? If someone says, well, you know, she or he is too assimilated, what does that mean? You know, um, so, so I totally agree with you that it is a, I mean, so when I saw the film, finally, I was both horrified by it, but also intrigued by everything about it, that some of which came out in spite of itself. And so, so for me, like all those moments when the stereotype um, unravels itself, um, overexposes itself. So I don't think those are moments that are intentional on the part of Rogers and Hammerstein or, you know, Joseph Field um, or Costner, you know, the, the director. Um, but I actually think that there's something about the stereotype that is remains a very um, real problem even today. So to, I was thinking about today, like today, if we were gonna make a movie about Asian Americans and we, we don't want it to be stereotypical, what would it look like? And some of the films we will watch in this series will answer that question <laughs> you know, precisely. But I think normally our response to negative stereotype is to either one deny it and say, well, the person may not really like that, or to replace it with something positive, right? So instead of the yellow peril, we say the Asian is a model minority. But the problem with replacing a negative thing with a positive thing is that you just sort of change the players. We, we haven't really changed a value system underneath, you know? Um, and so I think that, you know, there's a way in which you're totally right that there's something so painful and awkward and and so regressive about flower drum song. 
But at the same time, the, op the other side of that is that actually the problem of representation remains a problem. It remains a dilemma. You know, it's very hard to represent someone without immediately having already fetishized them or stereotyped them, or, you know, because there's a very fine line between type as something recognizable and stereotype. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. That was a very interesting, thought-provoking answer, especially the, the type and the stereotype dichotomy. Mm -hmm. so, something I personally should think more about. Um, I'm going to go with Ida, and then we have Anne Avalon. I was thinking the thing that made it revolutionary, really, was that it was an Asian cast. Even to this day, what, Miss Saigon on Broadway, at first she was not going to be an Asian woman. Um, Natalie Wood in um, West Side Story. So you have to give the credit just for saying we're going to have a cast of Asians, um, oftentimes Native Americans. Um, the first Americans were never represented in movies. It would be someone else in some sort of a makeup. So you have to give them that, I think. Um, and certainly yeah, and, at the time. Yeah, and, and, and these, these, and these um, all these performers were actually, you know, they were paid. So that's actually, you know. So yeah, I think that is, I, I think that remains a, a pretty significant thing. No, it's funny that you would say that because I'm an actress and whenever I see Black people in movies, even those really horribly cringy ones from the third, yeah. I go, well, Black people getting paid, so. Yeah, although we can also, um, well, we also know that um, the pay can be very uneven. I was thinking about um, Anna Mae Wong in um, um, uh, Shanghai Express. I don't know how many people have seen that, but um, Shanghai Express, Marlena Dietrich and Anna Mae Wong, and I did some research on this years ago, and I remember looking up the financial, the financial papers. And so NMA, so they used to pay actors and actors according to the num the amount of time they spend on the film. And in um, Shanghai Express, Anime Wan and Marlena Dietrich actually have the same amount of screen time, but Marlena Dietrich made five times the money that Anime Wan did in that movie. You know, and partially it's because, you know, this Marlena Dietrich is more famous, but it's also partially because um, Anna Mae Wong was not a white actress, right? So, so yeah, I, I think, um, yes, it's good that they were paid. How much they were paid, you know, is another issue. And yeah. this is even, just to add on to Ida's point, even very recently with um, the live action movie um, of, uh, of the Japanese anime, Ghost in the Shell, with Scarlett Johansson, um, people were very upset by the, the whitewashing, right? That. Yeah, I wanted, um, was wondering if you'd give us some of your observations on more contemporary Asian films, such as The Farewell and Minari, if you've seen those, and, and yeah, have, how that comes into play here. And actually, I love those films, and that's why they're in the series as well. <laughs> so they're coming up, and I have actually invited um, some colleagues of mine to, to host um, some of those conversations, just because it's nice to hear from other people. And I, I promise you, I picked the smartest and also most fun people, so you have to come back and listen to them too. Um, but yeah, I think that, the, you know, um, I think Minari especially, um, I did a conversation with um, the director uh, for Princeton University, um, you can find it on YouTube, um, and, and he was incredibly kind, but also super smart. Um, so Minari is a wonderful contrast, right, um, against, uh, because it is a, if, um, if uh, flower drum song is full of what I call pathological euphoria, um, Minari is its opposite. It's super quiet, right? Um, it's a very quiet movie, um, but it was, but it is so rich, um, psychologically rich, right? Every moment is exquisitely done. And you see all this complicated relationship between the family members. Um, so one thing about that movie um, that I thought was um, sort of in relation to your question is that it's not that Isaac offer a, um, positive image of Asians, right? So if, if we think Flower Drum Song as offering a very reductive, um, flat 
you know, um, almost cartoony, right, characters of what Asian Americans are supposed to be like. Minari is the opposite. Not, actually, I'm sorry, not the opposite. It's not like he offers you a positive representation. What he offers is actually just real people, right? The depth of psychology, people with ambitions and contradictions. You know, the father who wanted to, you know, who has all this wild ambition to have this big farm, even as he's supposed to be against the wish of his wife, even though, you know, he was supposed to be whatever, um, doing this for his family. I think that the beginning of the movie, you know, when they were driving towards this, and he's saying, we're going to go to this basically Eden paradise. This is our future, you know, blah, blah, blah. and you're all excited and you get there and you see nothing. And then that trailer or cinder box, they even have stairs. And the wife got out of her car and she said very quietly, this is not what you promised me. And you just go, Oh my God, right? And from that moment on, the movie just, and so, so what I was going to, so one thing that I was talking to the director about was that he said, I didn't want to make a movie that explained Asian Americans to white people. It is just about this family, which is actually his family. It's semi autobiographical. So I thought one of the difference between Flower Town Song and Minari would, around this question of representation, it would not be one is a bad representation and one is a good representation. It's more like one is the, the latter, is actually trying not to be representation at all. I mean, of course it is, it's a movie, but it's trying to actually offer um, a, a, a much fuller portrait of people who are complicated and contradictory and not always nice. I mean, one of the things about our movie is that it makes you, remind you that we can be really mean to the people that we love the most. Um, and so there was, you know, there's all these quotidian affection and quotidian cruelty that happened. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, a sort of, so I think that that's one answer to, well, how do we represent, you know, Asian Americans? But you should see the other movies, because I think, I think I wanted to start with something that's very mainstream and very, and in a lot of people's memory, you know, as a sort of cultural artifact. Um, and then we're gonna very quickly move forward to more contemporary pieces. I have a question, Anne, that yeah. I might jump in with. So I was wondering um, if you thought at all, this is something I was thinking about is if the movie is trying to show some sense of self-awareness of Flower Drum Song, I think at one point the father says something like all white men look alike. So I didn't know if that was like being <laughs> tongue in cheek or being self-aware of how it's like certain people are perceived and then flipping it on its head. And I was wondering, I don't know, do you think that that is effective at all and maybe balancing the cringier parts of the movie or do you think it just- Yeah, sort of I mean, I do. I mean, that's what I think is kind of interesting about it. You know, like to me, there's a lot of those moments, you know, um, when the movie is making fun of the way Asians have been making fun, has been made fun of. Um, you know, the Chap Suey song, the father saying that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of moments when that happened or when, um, when um, Mei Li says, I'm a wet bag, my back is wet, right? And that is a particularly funny thing to say, um, partially because if you think about it, the history of border patrol around California started with an anxiety about Asian immigration, not Mexicans. The, or, so like the original real wetbacks, so to speak, of California were the Chinese. Um, and so when she's, so it sounded like she was borrowing like a metaphor about Mexicans, but it's actually, she's actually pointing out something historically really accurate. Um, so I, yeah, I do think all these, there are all these moments where um, the movie, exhibit these sort of uncanny alertness. Um, and there are not that many of them and they're embedded within all the, you know, um, extravaganza of stereotypes, um, but they're there. And I think they're really interesting. You know, it begs the question of, um, you know, um, like I think, I, you know, I don't know if it's true. So this is not, I, I can't, you know, uh, I can't prove this. But one of the things that I think about stereotypes is that 
every time you stage a stereotype, it has the potential to undo itself. You know, we always think about a stereotype as a way of nailing down a particular, uh, nailing down a two-dimensional reductive image of someone. And it always does that, of course. But sometimes, uh, well, often the staging of it ends up like showing its own weak legs, you know? Um, and, um, and so, so um, yeah. So I think that's what happens a lot in, in Flower Drum Song, that in spite of all of the Orientalist projections and stage setting and expectation in none does. And I think the reason why those moments happen especially more is precisely because, not precise, not only because, but, but partially because these are real Asian bodies. You know, somehow that line about why people look alike wouldn't work if the father was Edward G. Robinson in yellow face, you know? But, but do you think also the stereo, like you were saying, the stereotype can sort of fall, or in so, I, what I'm understanding you to say is point out the sort of you know that it's built on sand. But is, isn't that more because we're looking at it from a 2021 sensibility? Like what? Ha like it may not have that impact. When, right. when, when no, the movie true. came out. Yeah, no, no. I mean it's it's uh you know it's a it's a 21st century, but also the the, the look of the of the, the, the critical person <laughs> right looking at it. Um and you know and for for you know normal everyday person in 1961 they're not gonna notice that right um absolutely but I do think that um um that well I guess one point I want to make is that I think the stereotype if you think of a stereotype as an effort to nail down something and reduce it, um, it's, not, it's not always successful. You know, the thing you're trying to nail down doesn't always go quietly, <laughs> right, for example. Um, and also, I think it's very interesting to think, I, I have to think, I also think it's very important to look at stereotypes and study them and think about them in, in like pretty much the way we're doing tonight, right? And the reason I say that is because it's so easy to get very PC and say, and dismiss something as a stereotype. And so, yeah, that's bad. We don't look at it. But when you don't look at a stereotype, you actually might miss certain things. You might miss the ways in which that the, the, the leakage beyond the stereotype that I'm talking about, right? You might miss the fact that, um, that the stereotype reveal more insecurity on the part of the person perpetrating it than the, the thing or the person being stereotyped. You might miss all kinds of things. I just feel like there's a way in which when we call something a cliche, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a moral judgment. It's oftentimes you know, right, right? But it also means we stop thinking about it. And I think it also means we stop knowing about something. And so it has the effect of unwittingly reinforcing that stereotype because you stop talking about it, because you just, oh, that's just bad. Um, and you turn your eyes away from it. Um, so, so yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think you're right. That, you know, and in fact, you, you know, I'm sure there are people, even if I were to say, hey, let's look at this movie this way, they will still say, you know, I don't see it. <laughs> you know, it's just a movie about songs and dancing. It's just about pretty girls dancing. Um, or something like that. So, um, so yeah. Elise? Hi, um, I'll come back with another comment, which is, well, it's a question for the women in this discussion. Um, I was kind of appalled by, you know, the sexual politics in this movie. Mm -hmm. um, the only woman with any agency was the aunt who got her citizenship mm -hmm. and and, and props to her. But, you know, there were what, three, uh, three other women in this movie and one of them was kind of a gold digger and the other two really had very little agency of their own. Uh, and I'm just trying to figure out if this is just a problem of a 1961 movie or you know, made by, you know, aging white Jewish men. <laughs> Or, or, or if it's a reflection of some kind of values that may have been um, um, valued in Asian society. I mean, I'm talking way above my pay grade now, 
but I'm wondering if you could comment on that a little bit. Well, I'd love to hear what other women um, on the panel think, you know, um, but I do think that um, it's almost impossible to think about what Asian agency might be, because this is a holy, as, like chap suey, this is a holy Western invention, right? Um, and I actually think that, you know, this is a, a critic in me, but I actually think that there are interesting moments in which these women have agency. And, um, and so I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. So one, um, you know, so Mei Li's agency is that in the end, well, first of all, like, if you think about it, she and her father are actually very agential in that they actually like stole their way, right, into America. Um, and, um, and at the end, she actually volunteers to be deported in order to be with Wang Da. Um, and she actually makes kind of a very American choice, which is love, right? She wanted to marry for love. That is certainly not, uh, you know, certainly not within the world that this would be a Chinese value. Um, and Linda Lo is interesting. I think she is totally um, uh, materialistic um, and, um, and there's a moment, you know, one of the one of the reasons that you hear the song I enjoy being a girl play all the time today in piano bars, right? Why is that? And that is because that song, it's not that the song celebrates femininity. The song actually denaturalizes femininity. Right. If you remember the lyric, you know, I've sat there with a pound and a half of cream upon my face. I, you know, so it's a song that deconstructs what it means to be a woman, makes it very un, and therefore make it almost anybody can be a woman. And this is why that song is at piano bars in San Francisco up to this day, right? The most popular song. Um, and so that, the, when she says, I enjoy being a girl, you know, you can make the argument that she's being performed by gender expectation. But at the same time, I think there's a way in which um, she, by denaturalizing what it means to be a success in her gender, she's actually, not, I'm not, not intentionally not, but part of the consequence of that song, I think, is that you see femininity um, being unpacked as a set of cultural expectation rather than a natural femininity, right? It's, it's about the cream, it's about pearl around your neck, it's about having the proper you know, arm candy, you know, uh, male version of that. Um, so yeah, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I think, you know, it is very 1960s gender politics. I mean, the fact, except what I think is important here is that that very 1960s gender politics is being projected onto a supposedly regressive atavistic Chinese patriarchy, right? Because we're supposed to think those Chinese people, they are so backwards that they check their women out like horses. Um, but it's 1960 gender, just but then but then it's sort of put on the Chinese, right? If you look at all of the other movies from the 60s with women in them, I mean, Gidget and things of that nature, I, I this actually had some stronger women than some of the women you see in the movies from the 50s and, and 60s. I mean, it's yeah. pretty fine back then. Yeah. Yeah, in the comments um, in the chat, some people are saying the same thing, that it, it seems more like a product of their time and that um, other other things like Doris Day movies mm. had somewhat similar gender politics. But uh, you brought up Helen earlier and she is really interesting to me because she does she does try to get um, the lead. Uh, in to st I, I love her. I've, you feel, you know, that it's the marriage plot. Everybody gets something except for Helen. So, <laughs> And not just, and not only did she not get anything, and not only does she not get the boy, not only is she forgotten by the credit, but her song is practically a suicide, right? In a love story, she sings, love, look away from me. And in her dance sequence, she is thrown down a chute. <laughs> her own dance on her. <laughs> it's like insult to injury. <laughs> I think Helen became a really fabulous Hollywood designer. Yes. That's what happened. She, she, she's laughing at all of them now. She was that's right. That's right. She's the new Edith head.
But yeah, if you if you read look at it, it's really fun to go and look at. If you look at the lyrics for um, um, I Enjoy Being a Girl and the lyric for Love Look Away From Me, they're really, they're almost like, um, I mean, they're, they're really fun, you know, speaking of textual analysis, they're really fun to, to think about because they're so revealing in some ways. But yeah, poor Helen, I really feel for her. And even her like big knife with Wanda was blurred. <laughs> she just, just doesn't get anything. Hi, Andy, did you have something? This would have been really fun if we get to be in the theater and watch it together. I know. Talk and I have popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. That is Maybe one day soon, yes. Let's see, do we have any more questions or comments for Anne? Anne has a question for Anne. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't talked about um, the younger son, Wang son. Oh. He was he I got a I got a kick out of him. He was really something. Well, I mean it's it's true. I think, you know, well, I have my take on him, which is no um, but well first of all, I want to say that it is um it's also um a kind of a, a trope that you will you will sort of play out immigration and citizenship dilemma as an intergenerational crisis. Right. So that it's, you know, it's the father's old way versus the young's, the son's young way. And the son, you know, the younger son, it's, I think, much more closely aligned with Linda Lowe. Right. They have the number together. Um, he also walks around in the baseball outfit. Um, who does that? <laughs> Actually, not an American. The only an un-American who walk around in a baseball outfit. Um, but I, I actually thought that, you know, um, one of the interesting things, I, you tell me what you think is interesting about a son, but one of the interesting things about him for me is that he represents um, the scene where he's dancing and doing the ballet moves. I know the plot says the father is upset because he's not being, you know, traditional and blah, blah. But I think there's also a gender thing there too. But I think that the father is, is, is not happy seeing his son ballet dancing. So there's also this sort of masculinity crisis thing going around. But tell me why you like the son so much. He is pretty funny. I, I just thought he was an incredible dancer. I, I loved, I enjoyed that number so much because he just the effervescence and the, you know, like he's full of life and, you know, and he was really sort of, I think, a caricature of, of a typical teenager, just like, oh, dad, you know, you don't know anything. And, you know, and that, and that I think made it probably more relatable to people that, oh, look, you know, yeah. you wouldn't, you wouldn't, the stereotype is he wouldn't dare speak up and misbehave that way and be disrespectful. But yet he was really kind of pushing it and trying to be really like the like his like his peers probably at school or you know something like that. Well, you know, you just reminded me of something, which is um, you know, there were so many talented dancers and singers and performers in the, I mean, even when the songs are not great, the voices were fine, you know, the dancing was great. There was a lot of there were there were better dancers than there were actors, right, in this movie. Um, but those dancers, you really never see them again. You know, um, I was thinking about, oh, you know, there's this moment when you have all these Asian American performers, but then nothing, right, after that. I mean, Nancy Kwan has a long career. Um, you know, you know that you can still see her today, right, on TV, like in the middle of the night. If you're ever up in the middle of the night, um, she is something called Pearl Cream, the ancient Chinese secret to beauty. Um, she's on some infomercial. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a, a question in the chat about terminology. So uh, the term Oriental is a bit dated now, and we tend to say Asian. Somebody was asking uh, how and when that changed. Um, I think it changed when, now I, I don't know the exact answer to this, so um, I don't know the fact. 
But I think it changed when Ever Sa'i wrote the book Orientalism, in which he explained that Orientalism is a Western idea about the, West, about the East. It is a system of knowledge production about the East undertaken by Westerners who are Orientalists um, in order to consume, conquer, and make use of the East. Uh, and he says in Orientalism that the Orient only exists in relation to the Occidental. There's no, um, and so, and I think from that moment on, um, that the, you know, Orientalism then take on this. And then if, in fact, if people remember for the longest time in universities, including Princeton, there was the Oriental department, um, the Department of Oriental Languages, for example. And then eventually that all switched and become East Asian Studies um, and, and other names like that. Um, but I would have, I would think that Sai's work was probably one of the big, um, motivation behind that change. And you know, it's, but it's also requires, um, you know, the thing about language is that it's all about nuance and connotation. And you, you have to understand the connotation and the nuances in order to, because the word themselves really doesn't have those kind of value. And, and words can be revalued. Right, so like today we use queer in a re recuperated way, right? Um, so, um, and, and the reason I say this is because my mother still says Oriental, even though I keep telling her not to, um, just pains me, but <laughs> she doesn't listen to me. <laughs> She's like, why not? That's who we are, we're Orientals. <laughs> I'm like, mom, Orientalism is blah, blah, blah. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't want to hear me. <laughs> Lecture. <laughs> um, Elise, we'll probably end with your question. Um, I'm sorry to, to come back yet again, but in talking about language, um, I was kind of charmed a little bit by the way the, um, the Chinese characters refer to each other by relation. Oh, um, you know, wife's wife's sister, or you know, what have you. And is, is that just based in the actual Chinese words for these relations? Is that how they would have spoken about each other? They wouldn't have addressed each other by name or by something more, more casual? It was all strictly relational? Yeah, it's, that's actually that is taken from a, a, you know, a Chinese cultural thing. Um, so, you know, because so Chinese society historically is extremely, um, uh, one, extremely family oriented, and two, extremely hierarchical, right? Um, and so you don't just have brothers, you have older brother, brother number one, brother number two, like you, you, you yeah, and it's also very relational in that, you know, there's two words for grandmother. One, if you use one, you know you're talking about the maternal grandmother. If you're using the other, you're talking about the paternal. Same thing with cousins. You could tell by the name, by the name that they, um, by their family structural name, whether they're older, younger, father's side, mother's side, you know. Um, so, um, so that there's a kind of, specificity, and I think it's partially because um, the whole Chinese family structure is very hierarchical. You know, I remember, this is anecdotal, so not, not real anthropology, this is me talking. But when I was growing up in Taiwan, I remember um, there was a lot of, there was always a lot of what we call the, which is uh, politeness around social things. That have to be observed. And one of the biggest um, crises that ever happens around the household is whenever, you know, if, you know, if my grandmother, for example, is having a dinner party, there's a whole thing about you got to invite the right person first, usually by order of importance, which is often age, right? But if you invite aunt number three before you invite aunt number one, you terrible faux pas, and then all kinds of like, you know, drama happens. Um, and so I just remember 
that that kind of you know um who comes first whose side of the family are you your mother's side or father's side and that's and that is a very patriarchal thing right because the father's side is always more important than the mother's side mm -hmm. very good question all right guys i think i think we're all set for the night thank you so much and thank you for joining me this is fun yeah our next everyone including Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. our next um meeting of the asian american film series will be monday october 25th so i hope i see you guys again then <laughs>